Hello and welcome everybody to the latest episode of Star Cells and God. This is the podcast where we explore the discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science and discuss how these discoveries provide evidence for God's existence, God's nature, and the reliability of the Christian scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, my name is Fuzz Rana. I am a biochemist and a Christian apologist. I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which is the sponsor of this podcast. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, I invite you to go to our website, www.reasons.org. Also, you can follow us on social media, rtb underscore official. And then finally, make sure that you go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, and click the bell icon so you can be informed when new videos are released from Reasons to Believe. And also, of course, make sure you subscribe. All right, I'm joined in studio today by uh, Jeff Zurink, and he's a, an astronomer, astrophysicist, mm -hmm. and also a Christian apologist, also works with Reasons to Believe. And Jeff, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the use of machine learning to analyze hominin burial sites, so can't think of a better person no, that's... To, to discuss that with. And then I don't think I know what you're talking about today. But uh, Well, so... some have said that often. No, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about uh, fine-tuning in the universe and just some uh, interesting developments in how fine-tuning actually arises in the fundamental constants from what we know about how biology has to work. So. Oh, wow. Well, why don't you why don't you take us away then? Well, very good. So, uh, you know, I mean, if you've been following Reasons to Believe any time, even my first introduction to Reasons to Believe and to apologetics actually dates all the way back to high school mm -hmm. where my chemistry and physics teacher was talking about how various aspects of the universe were fine-tuned for life. And, you know, these are things like the speed of light and the fine structure constant and the expansion rate of the universe and the strengths of the forces. And that's just been a hallmark and one of the thing of fine-tuning arguments and one of the hallmarks of reasons to believe is, you know, where Hugh took that not just in the structure of the universe, but even like where you are, what kind of galaxy, what kind of planet, those sorts of things. And that, uh, you know, Hugh's got this long list of, uh, you know, I don't know what the actual number is, but in terms of things for types of planets, there's, you know, hundreds of parameters. And even when he's talking about the fundamental aspects of the universe, he's got mm -hmm. hundred or you know, multiple tens more than, I, I can't remember the number, but some, let's say something on the order of a hundred. And why that's interesting is because or, or the particular aspect that I want to talk about is that there are kind of two responses I have seen to that. One is that you can't have that many fundamental parameters because when we look at the standard model of particle physics, the standard model of the universe, there's only 26 parameters that are put into that. Everything mm -hmm. else is is derivative or derived from that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of having this list of 100 mm -hmm. fine-tuned for parameters for the right. universe just shows you're not you're missing something. You're not mm -hmm. actually understanding the way things work because there's only so many knobs to dial. Right. And there's another response to that is, okay, yes, that's what these things are in our universe, but in principle, they could be different and life could adjust to that. And so those are kind of the two responses to, uh, or two objections that I think are interesting and relevant. Uh, there is another objection, which is we've got this notion that like the speed of light could be different but we actually have no way of knowing whether it could vary or not. Like with, you know, you could talk about a planet that's farther away or closer to its star mm -hmm. because we see stuff like that in our universe. But it may well be that the speed of light is what it is, and that's the only thing it could be. And even if it could vary, we don't know how much it could vary. And mm -hmm. so uh, often we talk about those as one part and whatever, and it's like, well how do you really say it's fine-tuned if you don't know whether it could vary and if it could vary, how much it could vary? Those are just right. things that we can't do. Right. And, and so when um, astronomers talk about fine-tuning of these parameters, what they're doing is is really kind of like a theoretical counterfactual analysis, right? So with the speed of light, you you know are holding all the other constants unchanged, and then you 
mathematically vary it, and then you look at the effects that it would have on, right. let's say, star formation, galaxy formation. Yes, that that's, that's exactly what's going on. And so you can, what's fascinating is that there's lots of quantities in the universe, like stellar nucleosynthesis or, or anything relating to electromagnetism is involved the fine structure constant. Well, that's got H, that's got, or you know, Planck's constant, that's got uh, the, the charge on an electron and the speed of light. And so these are these fundamental constants. And so by, you know, if you could in principle go in and say, all right, well, what would happen if the electromagnetic constant, force constant, or the alpha was larger or smaller, you can now then ask the question, if it gets much larger, well, the repulsion between like charges becomes too great mm -hmm. and the strong nuclear force or quantum chromodynamics more fundamentally, uh, what holds the protons together wouldn't be able to do that and so you couldn't get atoms. And so these are the sorts of things you mm -hmm. can do. But yeah, it's, a, it's entirely a counterfactual analysis, not let's go out and measure and see how this plays out because you we don't have other universes and we can't make other universes in the lab to do this. And so that's the way it's proceeded. And very typically the way it's proceeded is, okay, well, this number has to be, so like the fine structure constant alpha or uh, beta, which is the ratio of the proton mass to the electron mass. These things are pretty critical quantities that play into what goes on in stars and in the early universe where elements are fused from lighter elements into heavier elements. And so we've got a pretty good understanding of how that we can experimentally measure, you know, what goes on in there, what are the conditions, uh, simulate all of that. There's a lot of understanding. I don't want to in any way imply that that's as like, well, we're kind of guessing at it, but we've got a good enough understanding that we can now go ask the question, well, what happens if alpha were larger, or alpha were smaller. And you find that if alpha gets too large, well, this thing happens and you don't get heavier elements to form. Or if it's smaller, then this thing happens. So the, this, this is you know your counterfactual analysis you're going through there. One of the things that is that uh, uh, often arises out of that is that uh, as people have looked, what you can do is actually show that things that appear unrelated, like the properties of water. You think, okay, properties of water, how does that depend on the fundamental constants? Well, it wouldn't seem to, but it turns out that we can do studies and show that uh, how protons, neutrons behave is related to the masses of the quarks. And so mm. you can make statements such that if the masses or the mass of the up and down quark were 4% larger, mm -hmm. water wouldn't have the properties it did. And right. so you can, instead of, looking at do you get the elements, you can actually begin to some of these other things that again appear set in stone, you can yeah. tie them to right. those fundamental quantities. And so yes, there's lots of different ways of expressing it, but it's actually right. the fine tuning, you can measure that in a way, even though, so the fact that you've got a hundred parameters doesn't mean we're saying there's a hundred things that can be tuned, but there's a hundred different dials or, or constraints on how these dials have to be set, if you will. Oh, I see what you're saying, right. So even though you're limiting the number of dials, the implications of tw tweaking that dial becomes you know, much more complex. Yes, yes. Because there's so many other factors that are contributing to life mm -hmm. that are being impacted by that that dial twist. Well, and in particular, what shows up in this is this is a paper in Science Advances. It's called Constraints on Fundamental Physical Constants from Biofriendly Viscosity and Diffusion. So, you know, typically when you're looking at the mass of proton, mass of an electron, you want to make sure, you know, as it relates to heavy element uh, formation is related to alpha, which is the fine structure constant, and beta, which is the ratio of the uh, proton to electron mass. And so as long as those are within this range of, you know, again, dealing with our counterfactuals there, as long as those are what they are, you get plenty of heavy element, for, or you know, the heavy element formation. But that's, what this paper is showing is that that's not a sufficient condition for a universe that has life in it. Because one of the things that we know life requires, uh, unless we're, uh, you know, again, unless we're talking about some other just entirely unknown form of life, you talk about life, 
Uh, it happens in the matrix of water. Water has a certain viscosity to it. The, the other uh, fluids that are involved there have a viscosity to them, which affects flow of stuff into and out of the cell. And in multicellular organisms like us, it also impacts motion of fluids within the body. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you've got the viscosity of stuff moving into and out of the cell, but then you also have blood flowing through vessels and stuff right. like that. And you can actually go in and look and say, all right, we want, you know, we know that if things are too viscous, then you get things like tar, and where you've got tar, you can't, the, you can show just based on the chemical gradients you can establish in the because of the energy that flows out of chemical reactions. There's only so much you can push on stuff. If things get too viscous, then life mm -hmm. won't happen because you just can't get the processes that allow right. life to occur. And so what they show in this paper, and I'm not going to go through all the calculations because they do the... The paper does the calculations quite well. So rather than go through that, the interesting part of that was that you can ask how does the viscosity, both the kinematic and the dynamic viscosity, the diffusion rates, all of these depend on the mass of the proton, mass of the electron, Planck's constant in various ways. And they can show that you can write all of those dependencies in terms of alpha and beta. And so as long as alpha and beta set you're there, but they're still mass of electron, mass of proton factors show up in there. So even if you set mm. the mass of proton, mass of electrons, so that beta and mm. alpha are in a range that permit the heavier element formation, that doesn't mean that you're going to get the mass of proton, mass of electron, and Planck's constant in a range where things are viscous enough that the life's, that life's biochemistry can happen. Right. And so it really does say that these other knobs are relevant, or not, not, even though there's only 20 ish knobs, right. these other constraints are something additional to. It, it's not just, well, another way of saying 20 right. things. So it, it increases the amount of fine tuning that shows up there. Right. So not only do you have to tune the knobs so that alpha and beta are in the ratio, they, you have to turn the knobs so that alpha or beta are in the proper ratio, and the viscosity isn't too high. Uh, so you got to get both of those. And, mm -hmm. and that, to me, also goes at this other argument that, well, we can simulate universes where, for example, if alpha and if beta were a little bit higher, then we could get a whole lot more nucleons in the universe. Well, the more nucleons <laughs> there are, the more likely you are to have life because there's more materials to make life. Right. But just because you get more of the materials th to make life doesn't mean that the materials have the proper viscosity so that the chemistry of life happens. Right. And so that, that is just what I found pretty fascinating about this discovery is that one, even these downstream properties of viscosity, which are not right. fundamental, if you will, I mean, right. and, it, and it, it wasn't just that water becomes too viscous. They can show that there's you know, like where you look at the properties of water and, okay, that's tied to the mm -hmm. fundamental constants. This was viscosity of any liquid that could exist. Uh, so it's, it's a universal viscosity lower limit to it. Once it gets above that, everything mm -hmm. has the viscosity of tar. And so you can't, it's not that you just can't get life based on water. It's that there's no liquid that will exist, yeah. which will have the viscosity that requires life. And so- Wow, that's pretty interesting. I, I mean, it- just kind of intuitively what this, or apart from the interesting physics calculations, it really does say the, the fine tuning seems to be deeply baked into our universe. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, the more we understand, it seems to go away. The more we study, it's like, wow, there are some really serious constraints on what life requires. Right. And on the flip side, to recognize just because we've got a few of these things nailed down doesn't mean we have an understanding of the universe. This is, you could very easily say, well, we've got alpha and beta nailed down. We kind of understand what the fine tuning is because we now know what it takes to produce the heavier elements. But life requires more than that. And getting those conditions that the more than that happens gives us addition. It's fun stuff to learn as well as revealing the fine tuning that shows up. Yeah. 
a couple of years ago, I had a book published called Fit for a Purpose, mm-hmm. which was making the case that we actually see anthropic coincidences in the nature of biochemistry and the structure and mm-hmm. the function of biochemical systems. So it, it's it's kind of extending the idea that there is a uh, an anthropic principle in biochemistry. And of course, there's also an anthropic principle that we see in chemistry. This is something that really is the inside of, uh, of a of a scientist named uh, uh, Lawrence Henderson right, okay. in the early 1900s, you know, and, and so it's the idea that we see these anthropic principles that are emerging, mm-hmm. maybe even in biology, and it seems to me like the point of this work that you're discussing is that these are anthropic principles that are ultimately intertwined with one another into really a single anthropic principle. Right, and so mm-hmm. you know, you know, part of the idea of, the, of a chemical anthropic principle is that water has these highly unusual, just right properties that make it ideally ideal for life. And there's mm-hmm. all kinds of properties that water has that uniquely make it suitable for life. And and you can show that it's most of these properties are stemming from the hydro, the strength of the hydrogen bonding right, interactions. Right. Right, which you know, and so you can play around and show that if the hydrogen bonding interactions were stronger or weaker, mm-hmm. you know, that life wouldn't be possible for a variety of reasons. And of course, that hydrogen bonding interaction relates to more fundamental properties of, right, yeah. of, of, the, of the universe, the, the constants of, of physics. So it seems to me like that idea of the anthropic coincidences kind of emerging at different regimes of complexity you know, in the universe may have some deeply fundamental explanation that Mm -hmm. this work is, I think, beginning to get at. Yeah, just as I was sitting there listening to you describe that, I mean, okay, so yes, viscosity, which at some level is not a fundamental property of things, nonetheless has ties to fundamental characteristics right. of our universe. And I could see that play out. I mean, the further you get when you start talking about chemical interactions, especially within the cell and even biochemistry, it, it does seem to me that, you know, talking now about, you know, fine tuning of viscosity, okay, that's like, okay, well, that's not fundamental, but it helps us understand it, recognizing that very often that's going to be tied, or or yeah. we should expect that a fair bit of that will be tied back to yeah. these fundamental parameters. So, gives us two 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 things to keep, uh, uh, at least in terms of objections, to bear in mind. Is that when somebody comes along and says, "I can build a universe that, where there are more baryons in it, or where there are more planets or more stars," it may be. But it doesn't mean that universe is habitable because it may not have the right kind of viscosity or the right kind of protein folding or, you know, I mean, I don't know what, how it's going to play out, but there may be some of those things that are, yeah, just random the way the, the way the chip falls, the way the, the way it just happens to fall out. But it seems like a lot of those may actually be tied back to those fundamental quantities. So that thing you thought, oh, okay, I could tune it and make it better. Right. We don't know well enough to know what else is going to go on in there. Right, right. Well, and, and from my perspective as a, you know, a biochemist, I would say viscosity would be, you know, a property of water mm-hmm. that, you know, is, is what makes it, you know, it has the just right viscosity. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And, and, and I would see that as being connected largely to the hydrogen bonding interactions. Right. But what you're saying is that that's even, there's even more fundamental, uh, connections or explanations for that viscosity right. beyond just simply hydrogen bonding interactions, although those probably too are, are right. related to, you know, um, you know, you know, the, the, probably the fundamental, uh, quantities that define electrons. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, you know, just another, you know, talking about the hydrogen bonding, it wasn't that long ago I was writing a paper where they're trying to understand how, why does uh, water have the, the molecular structure that it does. And it turned out that when you started to put quantum mechanical considerations in there that, uh, you know, part of the, the – there was something related to uncertainty in the bond angle 
And as that did, it's like water didn't have the properties. But when you recognized, oh, there was also uncertainty in the bond length, that lo and behold, it, actually the hydrogen bonding is fundamentally tied to the way quantum mechanics works mm -hmm. in our universe, which I don't know, there's no knob that we have for the strength of quantum mechanics, or not, not that's right. often talked about, but even hydrogen bonding, the right. moment you get there, the connection now to fundamental physics is actually much stronger than it would appear because yeah. you just, oh yeah, hydrogen bonding, that's a chemical phenomenon. That doesn't right. relate to the fundamental characteristics yeah. of the universe, so. Yeah, interesting so. stuff. And of course, really is, yeah. you know, when we see this kind of fine tuning, that points very clearly to design and a designer, yeah. right? So. Yeah, and, and you know, that's, that's one of the things I've found is that for a long time I was just talking about, oh, fine tuning and recognizing that fine tuning is really a way of saying that there's design or purpose. Yes. And so it may be that some of the calculations of the one part in 10 to the five or whatever, that it may well be that the fine tune, the, the, the ratios and the probabilities turn out to not be, mm -hmm. but it's still, you see that it seems like our universe has a purpose to it. And this right. is just a way of quantifying that. But the fact that we see it on so many levels like this really just, it strengthens that idea that it's here for a reason, not just by accident. Yeah. And so, and yeah. th as you said, if things are not here by accident, they point towards a purpose. Now the question is, what's the purpose? Well, I think the one very obvious and straightforward conclusion is that there's a creator who did that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. That, that was really <laughs> fun, Jeff. Thanks for that. You know, um, when I, uh, you know, introduce my discoveries, I like to do a little joke or a little story. And uh, th this time I'm going to be a little bit more serious because a few weeks ago, uh, from the point that we're recording this podcast, you and I attended the memorial service for our friend and colleague, Dave Rogstad. Right. You know, and uh, beautiful service and uh, just an incredible human being, mm -hmm. a, you know, a consummate scientist, but also, you know, a, a man who was, uh, you know, lived out his faith as a Christian and... It know, impacted just a lot of people very positively and yeah. I, I, he was... Great, great friend of mine. I was yeah. sad to see him go and glad that he's in heaven now, too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, just a, someone who loved his family and, 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 and really served his family. So what a, what a, you know, powerful memorial service. But, you know, I've been thinking quite a bit about burials lately okay. <laughs> as part of the, you know, homo naledi claims and, All right. you know, and, and, and other things like that. So as we were going through the service, not only was I, again, deeply moved— but I can't help but be a scientist sometimes, <laughs> you know. And so, so I'm, you you have those weird things where it's like if people really knew what I was thinking, they'd think I was weird. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe even deranged. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sitting here thinking, you know, as an anthro from an anthropological perspective, I'm not an anthropologist, but if I put on that hat, what's going on here at this memorial service mm -hmm. that that it from a you know more of a clinical standpoint. And then how does that connect to who we are mm. as human beings? And so it was a memorial service. So, you know, part of it was memorializing or, or giving honor to to Dave. Right. And part of it was as a community, we're there to support his family mm -hmm. who had like, suffered a loss. And then also as a community, we suffered the loss of Dave. And so we come together as a community to process our, our loss and process right. our grief. You know, but... For anthropologists, this idea of memorial services or really funerary practices is considered to be something that r defines us as human beings, mm -hmm. right? They, they see the idea of an of a intentional ritualistic burials or, or disposal of bodies, because sometimes bodies are disposed other ways besides burial, is really reflecting something that makes us unique and distinct as human beings. Now, hmm. other animals will express grief and remorse at the loss of individuals they they, they will uh, even uh, might you know bury the dead intentionally mm. but sometimes this is just caching the dead getting kind of getting rid of the body okay. more so than anything like that but sometimes they will interact with the body or with the site where the body was discovered and it becomes something that they either avoid or they are drawn mm -hmm. to. So there is a, a grief response that animals display, 
but humans do it in, in a highly organized way that involves the the entire community, and that many times, the you know these funerary practices reflect a sense that we recognize our own mortality. So there's it's a, a type of self awareness that mm. other animals don't appear to have. Right, and also we it oftentimes. Uh, demonstrates a sense that there is an afterlife, mm-hmm. that there is a reality beyond this physical material universe, a- and that many times the view is that the, the the funerary practice is part of the process by which we help that individual who's died transition from this mm. plane of existence to the next plane of existence. Okay, and so the you know the burials are oftentimes will have grave goods. Mm-hmm. that are either something that was very valuable to that individual, define that individual, or maybe something that we th- as a community would say you're going to need in the afterlife, mm-hmm. in the next life. Right. So, so it's, there's, very, there's a very sophisticated sense of reality that flows out of funerary practices that reflects our capacity for symbolism and our ability mm-hmm. to create narratives using symbols by combining and recombining them. A, 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 a sense of a very complex reality, not just this physical reality, right. an awareness of ourselves uh, mm-hmm. that can imagine that there may be a time where we don't exist mm-hmm. and a time where we do exist. It also reflects a very complex community structure mm-hmm. where we we recognize that it's important for us as a community to help that individual who's just died, mm-hmm. right? And, and that we want to support those people that have lost loved ones. So there's an expression of love, not just between two individuals, but really between the community, the community itself yeah. and members in the community. So it, when you think about it, funerary practices are reflecting very sophisticated cognitive abilities. Mm-hmm. And and the oldest known um, human burial, modern human burial, is about 77,000 years ago okay. in, in Africa, which is about the time where you begin to see very clear signatures for symbolism at, uh, okay. emerging for modern humans. So, so I have a question. But, I mean, I know you've got mm-hmm. a different discussion, but it, you know, I was just sitting there listening to your description that uh, you know, this idea that we are part of the funeral practice is to prepare for, you know, recognizing our place, that right. we may not be here, that there's part of that that's going on, recognizing that the people mm-hmm. have lost something. There's preparing this person for the next life, if you will. You mentioned that there are other creatures that have, I, I hesitate to call them funerary practices, but it's where there's, it seems like those often will show up in social animals, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, is there any is there any way of measuring or is it possible to measure is there a difference between we've lost a member which is a very social way to look at things as opposed to a there's more to life which is the way a human way looks at it right is there a way to distinguish that or is that still not really i mean okay. it's you know you're 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 observing what these animals are doing and then mm-hmm. you're trying to draw an point, inference yeah. as to what's going on in their minds right mm-hmm when they're engaged in these practices. But just looking at the practice itself, it's very clear that what modern humans are doing is much more sophisticated, much yeah, more okay. organized. It's ritualistic. It has, it seems to be pregnant with meaning, mm-hmm. whereas with animals, it's very clear it's a grief response, right? Not yeah, to minimize that, that right? Or it's a so, recognition. So, so there are indications yes. that, it's, it, that, that it's more social as opposed to yes. conscious, if you will. So, yes, okay, yes, all right. right. And in a recognition that now the order of things are going to change in that group, mm-hmm. particularly if it's a, a, a leader in the group. Or, right. You know, so, um, you know, so there's, there's a, a bit of a preamble mm-hmm. of, of, the, of modern human behavior and animals, but what humans seem to be doing, again, is sharply distinct. Now, gotcha. this is the reason why anthropologists are so interested in questions like, did Neanderthals bury their dead? Mm-hmm. D- you know, were there other hominins that, that buried their dead? So this is just a, a, a classic image of, uh, of a Neanderthal burial where people are trying to make an assessment as to whether or not this was a ritualistic intentional burial, that 
was again had meaning. Okay. And and so there's criteria that answer. So, so this is basically looking just at the head of the yes. the, the, the the buried right organism. Okay. Yeah. So but and so what you you know you you see from the all the labeling there is you know the scientists are trying to determine okay was this actually a place where there was deliberate excavation of the ground to create okay. a grave, right? Was the grave a regular shape, like a rectangular or mm -hmm. oval, right? So that's part of the analysis. How is, what skeletal elements are present? Mm -hmm. Are, you know, are they articulated in a way that's non-natural, that looks like the body was deliberately mm -hmm. placed in a certain position? Is there articulation of the skeleton that would suggest that there was, uh, the decomposition happened with the skeleton being undisturbed. Mm -hmm. So there's criteria that are used, but it's very challenging when you're looking at something <laughs> like this. Right. To Even though we have reasonable criteria to apply that criteria to something as complex as, as a, a, you know, a Neanderthal find. Right? right, okay. And then, of course, there's um, other hominins that people have claimed were engaged in, in a type of ritualistic burial, though it's heavily disputed. And by the way, it's heavily disputed with Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. Were they intentionally burying their dead or not? And if they were, again, was it there a sense of an afterlife? Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a cave site in, in um, Spain, and there's a lower chamber called the Cima de los Oasis, which is the which means the pit of bones. Okay. And there were about 6,000 uh, hominin skeletal remains recovered there dating, I think, about 430,000 years ago. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, this represents maybe about 16 individuals or something like that. Uh, and there's a debate as to whether this was caching the dead, just kind of disposing the dead down this chute, or were, were these just... Mm -hmm. hominins that fell down the chute and then died, mm -hmm. you know, in the pit of bones. There's also animal remains in there as well. Or was this a deliberate burial mm -hmm. that ha was r ritualistic in nature? This is a so, so in this structure, there's there's a ca there's a larger cavern part, and then there's a right. you know, what almost off the back looks like a yes. A sh that's that's the chute you're referring. Yeah, to. Yeah, okay. going into this lower chamber. Gotcha. Right, and then you and I talked a few weeks ago about, you know, Homo naledi, right, mm -hmm. and the Dinaledi chamber, and the idea that that these hominins were deliberately burying their dead mm -hmm. in a, through ritualistic practices, you know. But again, this is even though the the narrative that's being consumed by the popular, mm -hmm. you know, audience is that this was un unequivocally a ritualistic burial, it's heavily disputed by mm -hmm. other anthropologists who challenge whether or not the evidence is there. And again, part of the challenge is you're dealing with, you know, these very complex systems where you have each skeletal element and its arrangement in the ground, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And all the, the, the geological features in connection with that, so those skeletal elements are all mm -hmm. variables, right? That you're trying to analyze and make sense of and, and pull out patterns from, right. you know, and then evaluate them in light of a, a set of criteria. And it's just, it's the, the part of the debate reflects just the, the difficulty of doing that analysis. Well, it, it, would, it would seem like you also have to deal with what sort of natural processes are just changing the environment as well. Cause yes, and scavengers, was it flooded, did something, animals yeah, right. coming in. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah okay, so yeah, it is just complicated. It's a very complex system. And, of course, extracting data from complex systems is something that AI mm -hmm. or machine learning or right. they're not quite equivalent or, you know, multivariant <laughs> analysis are, are all very good at. And as I was reading um, about burials, I came across a paper published in 2018. So this is about five years old, but mm -hmm. it's new to me. So <laughs> it's a new discovery. But th this research team, and it's an international team, uh, used basically machine learning algorithms to analyze uh, the, the burial of, uh, at the burial site, um, Cima de los Oasis, and the Dinaletti chamber. Okay. And what they ended up doing is they were looking at what is the distribution of skeletal elements at these sites. So they, you don't even need to worry about how they're arranged and other things. It's just hmm. like, what are the skeletal elements that are present at these sites? And they developed um, a training s set 
This was an unsupervised analysis, meaning they weren't imposing categories, but they chose, you know, uh, data from the that's been published in the scientific literature that represent eight different scenarios. One okay. or four of them are prehistoric, where you have primary hominin internment. This is a, a clearly deliberate burial. Now, it doesn't mean that there's meaning attached to that burial, but it, at least it's a deliberate burial. Uh, stuff from the literature that not quite sure if it is or not. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's also instances where hominins are cannibalizing the remains mm -hmm. of members of the group, and then that's and then they're just disposing the remains. That's a secondary internment. And then finally, hominins that just died naturally, mm -hmm. right? That and they, their remains are just found naturally in, in, okay. in the ground. And then they looked at some modern situations, undisturbed modern human corpses, uh, modern human corpses that have been scavenged mm -hmm. by animals, and then baboons, where there was a leopard consumed baboon remains, and then baboons that died from, from natural deaths. So these are the, the eight scenarios that they used. And they discovered that when they did, you know, kind of a multivariant analysis that there were... Uh, let's see here, is that eight skeletal elements or seven skeletal elements mm -hmm. that turned out to be diagnostic. Okay. Uh, and the, there are the tarsals, which are the foot bones. All right. Uh, the metacarpals and the phalanges. So this would be the hand bones and the fingers. The carpals are the wrist bones, the radius and the ulna, these bones in your forearm. And then the, um, the fibula, which is on the lower leg and then the femur. So those are the seven uh, features of the skeleton that were diagnostic. And it makes sense because... And so this was diagnostic in, are they there is... Right, right. Is, that, it, is the, it, are they there or how they're arranged these are, or these, both? These are the skeletal elements. So they're, they're looking at what skeletal elements are present. Okay. And so if these are the skeletal elements that tell you, that distinguish between those different categories or the different okay, groups. Okay, so the, of the eight categories you put up there, some of those are intentional burials, some of those are, this is just what happened. Yes. And so these bones, or the presence of these bones, tell you or, the or absence. Dis distinguish yes. which category you're yeah, in. Yeah, okay. presence okay. or absence. And it makes sense because many of these are delicate bones mm -hmm. that are in limbs that would be prone for... Uh, that are prone to be lost, okay. you know, uh, if it's an accidental burial or if the, the remains are scavenged are going to be those that are going to be lost. Right. If it's a deliberate burial, they're going to be present and intact, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a, you know, um, these are the, again, yeah. the diagnostic features that you're looking for. And then they, they did a, what they called a three-group and a four-group model, Mm -hmm. How do these groups cluster together, right? Okay. You know, and what they saw in the three group model, which is, is that there are three categories. The one on the left is essentially a deliberate human burials. Okay. Or deliberate hominin burials. The one on the right are those remains that are clearly have been scavenged. Okay. And then in the middle, you've got kind of this heterogeneous mix of everything else. Okay. Right. And it turns out that the Sima de los Oasis and the Dinaletti group into the into that heterogeneous category. So mm -hmm. it's you can't say that these remains have been scavenged, but it doesn't look like these remains are deliberate burials. Okay. They, it looks like there's something else going on okay. uh, with this. And so you see the same thing with the the four model. It's just uh, a, you know looking at a different um, cluster analysis, and then they you know uh, looked at different ways to analyze the the data using different you know, mathematical tools, and uh, all of them except for neural networks have the SEMA de los Oasis and the Dinaletti chamber clustering with uh, non-deliberate burials. Okay. And so the point is, is, is that this mathematical analysis really does indicate that the Dinaletti chamber remains and the SEMA de los Oasis are not deliberate intentional Burials. Interesting. Okay. There, 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 there's something else. Okay. There's something else going on there. It doesn't look like they're scavenged, but there's something else going on there. And so this is a, a very powerful analysis, I think, that eliminates the subjectivity mm -hmm. of trying to analyze very complex, you know, multivarial systems and in drawing conclusions from them. It's a much mm -hmm. more robust way to look at the data, and very clearly indicates again 
that it doesn't look like these high-profile claims of deliberate burials actually are, are, are valid, that they, they cluster mm-hmm. again with other types of burials. Um, now, well, it doesn't rule out Neanderthals, but mm-hmm. it, it does say for these two situations. Gotcha. Well, let me ask you a question, because this is, uh, you know, I was just re- thinking about this, you know, we were talking a little bit prior to the show, is that I've spent, you know, 30-ish years doing gamma ray astronomy or high energy astrophysics. And the introduction of machine learning kind of AI type techniques has been around for a long time. And I've heard numerous talks of, oh, if we take this type of machine learning or this type of AI or whatever, it's going to help us do better. And what I see is, you know, nice setups and here's our simulations and here's our training set. And then you go out and it just doesn't really give you much. In part, because at least with the processes we're working for. They're very complicated, modeling, modeling, shower formation as it goes through the atmosphere. And you're kind of looking for something new, you know, at least with ours, you're looking for something new and the lack of knowledge or our simulations are always just good enough. They're kind of at the boundary of our knowledge anyway. So looking for something beyond that, it just, it just hasn't worked. Why would you expect that to apply here or not, I guess is my question. Yeah, well, I think where, where this is becomes useful, now is this going to be a generally usable approach? Mm-hmm. Maybe not, okay. or maybe, maybe not. But at least what, for this particular approach, it, it becomes a much more objective analysis of the data, right? It allows you to, to see patterns in the data that you would not be able to discern, mm. okay. right? So I see that's where the real value is. And, it, and, it, and it's much more objective. You know, anthrop- paleoanthropology is a highly, is, is a discipline that's highly prone to sub- subjectivity. And, and, and Meaning pre- what? And, and, well, and preconceived bias. So, oh, okay, all right. So if you're a researcher and you're, you know, you're looking to make a career for yourself, mm-hmm. it's much more exciting if, if Homo naledi was engaged in ritualistic burials okay. than it is if it's just caching the dead, Right. It's much more, one's more, much more mm-hmm. exciting. And so it's very easy to go in when you got this complex system and legitimately point to features that seem to be consistent with ritualistic burial mm-hmm. and downplay features or even overlook or not even mm-hmm. be aware of okay. features that would lead to another conclusion, right? So I see the machine learning as taking that human subjectivity out of it, gotcha. at least with respect to these two burial sites. Mm-hmm. You know, you would need to do for each site probably a similar analysis, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but you do have a a pretty good training set here, right, that could be more broadly applied. Yeah, that actually strikes me as something different between what I was talking about, because we're always looking at data saying, okay, you know, we're we're kind of pushing the edge of the boundaries of the data, which we don't know whether there's gamma rays in that signal or not. That's kind of what we're trying to find. This seems like it's different in that you know whether this was a, you you can say, yeah, this was a baboon site where they were scavenged or not. There's other data that you can use to train that isn't the data you're actually wanting to look at. Yes, yes, yeah. So I see this, again, as valuable. But to me, the the take-home message is that there's no reason to think that the the human funerary practices are something that is occurring in other hominins. Mm -hmm. You know, that this this study really indicates that the funerary practices and the sophistication of the the way we we ritualistically process the remains of dead people really does seem to um, lead to human standing up out mm-hmm. and a standing apart in a way that would be consistent with human beings bearing God's image. And can you remind uh, which what groups of hominids are we looking at in the Naledi and the the well, other, the, these two chambers yeah, that we're looking okay, at. Okay, yeah. So Homo naledi is, is its own distinct okay, species. Okay, Homo naledi, all right. Yeah, and so this creature shows up at about um, 250 to 300,000 years ago. At least that's mm-hmm. the, the date for the site. And it's a, about four and a half feet in height, mm-hmm. brain size approximately that of a chimps, okay. a little bit larger than a chimps. Part of the, the anatomy appears modern. Part of it appears primitive. Okay. Um, the legs look like it's modern. The upper torso and, and uh, upper limbs look more Australopithecine-like. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, the hands looked like it would have had the dexterity to make tools. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's kind of an interesting blend. It's, it's mm. really a creature in and of itself. But if indeed it was engaged in ritualistic burials, this is shocking, even if you are an evolutionary you mm -hmm. know, anthropologist, because everybody correlated large brain size with that capability. Right. So, and then Cima de los Oasis would be uh, either a early appearing Neanderthal or a hominin that would have, from an evolutionary perspective, given rise to Neanderthals. Okay. Sometimes it's cl classified as Homo heidelbergensis, mm -hmm. though that may not actually be a valid uh, okay, species. Yeah. But, <laughs> Fair point. Okay. Right. So, so, it's, so both of these are prior to Neanderthals, yes. fairly old yes. creatures. And, okay, right. th okay, that's easy. Yeah, so, the, so that the, to your question, this is why the claims of deliberate burial become so significant. Mm -hmm. Because if indeed these creatures were engaged in deliberate burial, it means that what we think makes us unique as humans isn't valid. Has been around for a long time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Isn't valid. But this study really sa says, again, it, it does look like, you know, funerary practices that humans engage in really is unique. And mm -hmm. that what it takes to do that is what you would expect if for a creature that bears God's image. So it, it does, it, to me, one of the takeaways to this is, you know, I mean, and you've been saying this all along, it's not that I can say one way or the other, but there's reason to be skeptical and cautious about concluding right. that, oh, yes, the hu human behavior is just the next step or the, yeah. it, we've seen it before, that this really does give a good reason to say, right. yeah, there's, I could see why you might conclude that, but I think there's strong reason to think this is not what humans are doing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and I think, it, you know, another message, and, and I don't want to ever disparage people that are working very hard mm -hmm. in, in, as scientists, you know, uh, but it when it comes to anthropology, you know, you're dealing with, you know, very complex systems. And again, uh, you want to take conclusions that people are drawing from these systems where you've got partial skeletal remains, mm -hmm. the geology isn't isn't necessarily always well understood mm -hmm. and well characterized or characterized to the degree that you would want. There's missing information that you desperately need. Um, you want to be very cautious about accepting conclusions that people draw, mm -hmm. you know, particularly if those conclusions are earth shattering. Gotcha. Right. So. Yeah. Well, I, I, this is may seem like it's a curveball or at least out of left field, but I know in my apologetics career, one point, you know, it's a, there, there was a point to where it was like, so here's the apologetic takeaway that I almost kind of found myself missing just the, oh, wow, this is a really cool discovery. Yeah. That in some sense, as the apologetic stakes get bigger, the wonder and... I can see where you might be right type thing has gone. I, I, I just think of when I first started working at Reasonably, there's, you know, Paul Davies and many people who would, yeah, it certainly seems like it's design, you know, that that language wasn't uncommon even for someone who didn't think yeah. a God existed. And a lot of that's kind of dried up. Yeah. I wonder if that's attributable to raising the stakes apologetically. And so I guess my yeah. question is, is, is that, do we, is that, does that apply in this scenario here? Because there's you're working with stuff where it's just there's a sparse amount of data. It's really hard to draw yeah. conclusions. And so, so, I mean, I think people could push the conclusions too hard, but you can also be so skeptical of what right. might be that it's hard. It's just hard to, this is just really cool and I want people yeah. to know about it type thing. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I don't know if this is addressing your question, but you know, I, I do think you, um, your point is 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 valid because the more that I time I've spent studying hominins and in, in the fossil record and the archaeological record, the more and more I've come just to appreciate the the, the fascination <laughs> with what's going on scientifically, mm -hmm. right? That that there are these some very big questions that are being raised mm -hmm. by this area of study about who we are as human beings and how do we fit into the cosmos that are high stake questions to be certain but you know the the science in and of itself is fascinating yeah and you can begin to see why people would devote their entire lives 
to trying to work your way down <laughs> these very dangerous cave chutes to study, you know, these these fossil remains. Right. You know, and um, and and so, you know, y- yeah, you don't want to overlook just the 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 fascination mm-hmm. in in the beauty of what people are trying to discover and the cleverness, I think, in sophistication yeah. that the scientists who are studying this are bringing to bear. Right. You know, and I think this is a beautiful. This to me is is a paper that is what I would categorize as science at its best. <laughs> right. Where you know you've got a very, you know. Uh, very good approach to the answering a very important question that's being taken. Very good. It was a fascinating discussion. I appreciate yeah. the the yeah. discovery. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and, and bring everything to a close. I just want to say again, thank you for watching this episode of Star Cells and God. Love for you to join in the discussion about what you think uh, about the discoveries that Jeff and I talked about today. So use the comments. Uh, section if you're watching this on YouTube. And also remember uh, to go to our YouTube channel and to subscribe, uh, Reasons to Believe One, use the notification button to let people know uh, so that, so the, sorry, that, so that you can know when the next episode of Star Cells and God drops. And then uh, also make sure that you uh, take advantage of the fact that we have these podcasts available on your favorite podcast app. Make sure you tell people about Star Cells and God, share this video with other people on social media. And remember, the more we know about science, the more we have reasons to believe.